can't tell if I'm overdressed or I'm underdressed If I'm underpaid or just overstressed If I'm cynical or just over this Cause I'm tired of trying to get over there Man, it's Okay, I'm gonna day for exactly what we're speaking about. So, I know each and every one of us in here have gone through something crazy in this life. And as people have shared, you might be going through something right now that might seem unbearable. And today is an awesome day for you to come because we can talk about it. And believe it or not, your downfalls and your sorrow and your depression and your pain many times are a part of God's plan for your life. Amen. Believe it. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, whether or not you want to be a part of his plans for your life, that's your decision. So let us go into scripture. So if you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Corinthians. It will be on the screen, but if you have your Bibles or, on, or Bible on your phone, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 12. I love the letters, the epistles that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Um and again, follow along, it will be on the screen. Definitely try to take in this verse. It speaks to what sorrow is, and it speaks to what it's supposed to do in our walk with God. So, starting at 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 12. And on the screen is the New King James Version. Starting at verse 8, it says, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from less than nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Amen. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 8 through 12. So to put these passages in a better context for you guys. Paul is speaking to the Corinthians and he's explaining how their pain, although hurt him, he rejoiced in. And he rejoiced in their pain because he knew that once they understood their struggles and their sorrow brought about a call of repentance, all that pain, all that sorrow was for a good reason. Amen. Yeah. So Paul knew that with the different trials they were going to endure, they would think that man is a mess that this life falls on everyone they could finally seek out God's face more. And ultimately, they could begin to trust God more. Amen. Because remember, this is a relationship. And don't let no one tell you that it's not a relationship. And relationships take time, and things aren't always peachy. Things aren't always full of rainbows and sunshine. But understanding the trials and tribulations of this life puts this life into a better perspective. And once we can start seeing things clearly, we put our attention into things that matter most. Mm -hmm. Our trials beard our character into strong individuals dependent upon God. And yes, you can be a strong individual that is fully dependent upon God. Absolutely. Because some will say that your dependency upon God makes you weak. And in fact, no. Makes that you makes you strong. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So, let us go through these passages again. It's only four verses, but I think we can take so much from it. So we'll go through these passages, uh, and we'll just try to flesh out more meaning. So we'll go back to verses 8 through 10. And it says, starting again at verse 8, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, this is the second epistle, the second letter. He wrote two letters to the Corinthians. I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world produces death. So we have to see as we grow up, I mean that's as simple as I put it, as we get older, 
Because I know when I was young, I didn't think about things like this. I didn't care how the world uh, uh, circulated. I didn't care about, I just cared about little old me and what I want. <coughs> but as we look at this world in its entirety and start to try to understand it more and more and more, there are two different kinds of sorrow. And it's very much important to understand the difference between the two. One comes with hope. One comes with hope and the other comes with death. We see the sorrow in the world is all the pain and the hurt that we as believers and unbelievers we face. But see the sorrow in the world it ends just in that. Sorrow. A domino effect of bad things piling up upon themselves that eventually just consume the individual. Because the solutions to the problems in the world, if you think about it, I mean, there's only a handful of possibilities that this, this, this life in this world is giving you to help you solve your problems. So let's, let, let's look at that closer. So if you're stressed, if you're down in the dumps, what does the world prescribe to you as a solution? Alcohol? Pills? Drugs, substance abuse, the drown of the problems that we face, but that doesn't help the problem. No, it doesn't. Because once you come down from that high, guess what's still there and probably even more clearly there yeah. is your problems. Right. Amen. So again, what can the world provide you? Nothing. A visit to the psychiatrist or a therapist? Sitting down with people who get paid to listen to you? People that I can confidently say do not care about your life or your problems. Mm. I can confidently say that. The world is fading away, like Kirby said, and everything in it. So any solution from the world that it tries to prescribe to us, it's no different. The sorrow of the world produces death because if not given an eternal solution, we will not be able to find solutions to our problems. We will not be able to truly find help. We will not be given something that can shape us and mold us into people ready for enter, ready for anything. But on the other end of that, we'll just die. Underneath the insurmountable, insurmountable amount of problems that we face. And believe me, for those who have not yet experienced that, and believe me, for people that don't understand what I'm saying, that's coming and you will understand that. But let us see what the trials and tribulations of this world and godly sorrow bring about. So let us go back to the word. Let us go back to verse 11. Back in Corinthians. And verse 11 says, For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication in all things you prove yourselves to be clear in this matter. So this right here, this verse, man, this is what we're supposed to be able to take from the trials and tribulations and the pain and the hurt and the sorrow that we face in this world once we finally come to God with our sorrow. Amen. Amen. Paul right here is telling the Corinthians that their problems are supposed to create diligence. Which means a purpose, a person who is a hard worker, who is determined. Paul says, quote, what a clearing of yourselves. When you face the problems you face and can overcome them in Jesus Christ, there is no greater starting over than that. There is no greater cleansing from within when God's spirit comes in and wipes clear all the junk that we've piled up over the years, living lives underneath and from the effects of sin. God's sorrow creates a fear, a reverence, a respect for God. Yes. Our problems and godly sorrow create a vehement desire, which means an intense desire. Our problems we face make us more dependent upon God. And once God picks us up and puts us back on our feet and puts us back on the path that he has called for our lives, we only desire him now. Yeah. That's what comes from struggle. Because if the person that helps you get up, why would I run from you? <laughs> I'm going to stay right where I'm going to stay right next to you. Right, right. Yeah. What vindication, Paul declares. It's a victory, and it's a victory in all truest sense of the word. When you are vindicated from something, it is no longer attached. It is no longer a problem in your life. It is no longer something that you cannot rise above. Paul says, what vindication? 
There's no greater freedom than going through the problems we face in this life. Overcoming them, giving them all to God, and then from that point on, turning into people who are strong and dependent upon God that know no matter the challenge from this point on, I now have God on my side. What freedom, what vindication, what truth, what peace we get from that. That is what God's sorrow produces as compared to the sorrow the world brings. Freedom, life, and hope in Jesus Christ as compared to death and the solutions of the world that don't give you anything. Don't give you anything. I knew when I was drinking, and I knew that buzz was still not enough to wash away my problems and everything. I was, I was this rap. I can't. This is not it. Yeah. That was my personal story. And everyone has that. But let's go back to Corinthians and let's finish this passage, and then we can start bringing this to a close. So back to verse twelve. It says. Quote, therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who had suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. So just like Paul stated to the Corinthians, I'm not here to point out the, the, the wrong things you've done in your life. I'm not here to point out the people that you've hurt. I'm not here to point out the things that you have suffered from a lifestyle understanding. A lifestyle that we all, at one point, have welcomed into our lives. I'm not here to point that out. All I'm here to say today, in Jesus Christ, there's a way out of it. God cares for you and wants a relationship with you, but please, please understand that if you're going through something in your life right now, that is God definitely drawing you to Him. You have to start seeing that. If things aren't going exactly the way you want, it's because God does it want it to work that way for you. If you're so frustrated because you want something so bad and you think that that one thing is just going to be it, I, I could just get to this one point, if I could just receive this one thing and I'm going to be good, I'm going to be a good Christian from that point on, but it doesn't come that way, it's because God doesn't want it to come that way. Because yeah. remember, I talked about it a few weeks ago, God is sovereign. Our God is a sovereign God. He knows how it's playing out from beginning to end. Now, it doesn't affect our free will, but God knows how it's playing out. Remember, God knows how we will react in our time of distress. He knows what we're going to do. So don't blame God when bad things happen to you. Don't walk away from God because you're not getting things the way that you want, but begin to trust God. And know that he has it mapped out. He already had it mapped out. So we have to trust in that. And we can find our peace. We can find our strength. We can find our purpose in that. And understand that God is calling you. Now this is not a prosperity message saying that. Well, you ain't received a house or a bed yet. Then you must be living under sin. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying clearly if there is something in your life right now that is over the top weighing you down, and we've all been there. Only by the grace of God have I been able to get out from under that. Because I was under that for years, and people could tell you I was a kid that was so happy, so loving, so giving. I'm talking about throwing my brand new toys out the house to all the neighborhood kids, and my mom coming back like, are you serious? What are you doing? I just bought you these toys. Someone that genuinely was just a free heart of spirit, never want to conflict with nobody, always wanted to be cool with everybody, and I turned into someone that always had to start the fight. I had turned into someone that I wouldn't make a peep. You wouldn't know Jared was in the house. I was usually that person that Jared's here because you would hear some loud, ignorant laughing somewhere in the house. I turned into a person that had lost himself. Mm -hmm. And not even to get corny, and not even to get like on some Shawn Michael, you know, movies. I, I lost my smile, man. The world had taken my joy, my peace, my happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But by the grace of God, I was able to come back from that. But if you are facing something like that, if you know someone out there that is facing something like that, then the calling on your life is no more evident than right now. And you can't deny that calling. Don't turn from that call and continue to do what you want. 
But heed the call and start to search out God even more than you have before. If you push yourself, I promise you, just like when I went to school, and, and, and I promise you, people, professors, other fellow peers and students, they would tell me, you can work harder than you think you're working. Yeah. Because if you think that you're working harder than everyone else, and you think you're putting in overtime, you could actually push yourself harder. So it's no different in our walk. Don't ever think that, man, but I, I read so much and I pray so many. You can read more and you can pray. We have to want what God wants. We have to trust that what God wants for our lives is best. And we have to understand he has set up certain things within our lives that draw us closer to him. Now, I don't want to get all technical and I don't want to get into this weird, what is God thinking these bad things happen so that we would be more dependent upon him? Now, if you ask me personally about that, I would probably say yes. And people that are not mature enough to speak on that, well, what kind of God is that? How would God let, look, I just trust, I just trust the equation. I, I just trust it. So embrace your sorrow and your pain and use it and turn it around for God's glory. Again, like we said before, there's no greater purpose to doing that. And everyone's walk will be a little different. That will come off a little different. God will bring you down different alleys because you're all individuals. But that right there, turning your life, your pain, your testimony into something that can bring life and healing into someone else's life. Now, that's God's purpose for every single one of us. And it's different in different ways. But I'm telling you, there's no more greater purpose than that. No, there is always a way out for everyone. For every single person out there, man. And, and it's a way out from the way of the world and that you don't have to let your problems define you. You don't have to be people out there that are so hurt by the things people have done to them in their lives that it just is evident in everything that they do. You don't have to be that person. Though. You don't have to be that person that can't trust anyone with a simple task that comes at everyone with an attitude because of something that someone did in their past to them. You don't have to be that person, man. Your sorrow and your pain does not have to define you. Your relationship with God, once you lift up all that junk to Him, that is what should define you. That is where you should gain your purpose and your identity from. Amen. And it's hard. Trust me, I was there. It took me. This is not over that. That's why I say it's a relationship and it does take time. But if you trust God and you believe God is who He is, then you have to pour your life into Him. And then slowly but surely, I promise you, as that relationship matures, as you grow stronger in your walk, this will be like night and day. This won't be something that you have to think about it. Oh, I don't know. No, this will be like, this is all I have. I'm giving it to you. Because I trust you with who I am. And I want you to be there for me. And I want you to open up those doors and lead me down pathways that you want me to go down. Mm -hmm. And it takes time, man. So understand your sorrow and your pain to find you, man. Don't run from it. Because you'll forever be running. Turn around, stand and face it head on and declare it in Jesus Christ's name that I'm, I'm done running. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and I'm here, and I'm going to stay, and I'm going to fight this problem. And no matter how hard it might be, no matter how long it might take, we're going to get through this, man. And just know, God said, man, I, I, he's mighty to save, and he said he will finish that good work he has started in every single one of you guys. And I tear up thinking about that, man. Because, boy, have I gone down through some dark and murky waters, man. And for to know that our God is not going to lie, he's not going to break his promises, but to know that even if it's still hard now, with this walk with God. He's going to finish that job, man. He's going to finish that good work he started doing. Thank God, you got to take that promise. you got to believe in it, man. So, yes, you can overcome. Yes, you were built to overcome. Amen. If you want. Amen. And in fact, you have already overcome in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. God bless. Yes.